Hello and welcome to the tutorial on post-traumatic stress disorder. So this, um, as you know, is uh, a common question in CASC exams and uh, it's a standard question in order to take a history from, uh, from a patient in order to reach the diagnosis and uh, in order to do well in, in stations like this, initially the first key thing to, to be familiar with are the, the criteria for, for the diagnosis of PTSD and this also not only includes the, the range of symptoms that occur, but the onset that they occur within six months. Um, in terms of uh, having a, a, um, an exquisite stressor to, to cause it, and what I mean by that is that the, the stressor would cause um, just a, a, persi a, per a pervasive and uh, persistent distress in almost anyone that would have experienced that particular stressor. And then also having avoidance and arousal symptoms such as flashbacks and nightmares. I mean, interestingly speaking to, to some of the psychologists that work work here in London, it obviously um, was common um, in the years since the, the London bombings um, for them to be dealing with post-traumatic symptoms because of uh, that, that particular incident. Um, people were no longer coming to work, uh, were needing to get signed off, uh, as they could no longer travel on the underground, um, so they had avoidance there, uh, weren't able to concentrate at work, couldn't deal with, with, with stressful situations at work, weren't sleeping very well, and also had flashbacks of the event. Um, so let's um, talk about uh, this particular um, example. So again, when I introduced myself and uh, set the scene, um, he obviously didn't want to shake my hand. Again, don't be phased by, by that. And again, that gives you some idea as, as to, the, to the patient's mental state. Um, some of the key things were when he obviously revealed to me what happened uh, to him, it's demonstrating empathy um, to that um, event. Um, and again, in terms of when we're eliciting these types of uh, symptoms, it's, 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 it's um, very important to bear in mind that obviously every person coming into the exam will be familiar with all of the, the criterion for PTSD. And so the, the, the key thing is to ensure that you're not taking a, a tick box approach um, in your interview. So for example, you're not, you're, not, you're not reeling off, do you get nightmares, do you get flashbacks, are you irritable? So you, you certainly won't be, um, you certainly don't want to be doing that in your, in your interview. But again, what you want to be doing is to gently explore uh, the symptoms with open questions. So, for example, uh, saying, I see you're restless. How are you sleeping? Uh, then why is that? And then inquire as to whether the, the patient has nightmares. Um, or, I mean, I think just recalling the video, I mean, the actor was a little kind to me, just giving me the information uh, straight away um, in terms of the, the nightmares. or. Um, another example was um, when he mentioned that he was having difficulties with his girlfriend. Um, it's, it's, it's saying uh, something along the lines of, uh, you mentioned that your relationship with your girlfriend was difficult. Why was that? As opposed to going, are you irritable? Um, and again, um, I mean, as, as I said, with the, the, the actor was um, a, a little bit more forthcoming with the information during the interview, but um, if you if you recall, then with, with, with PTSD, um, sufferers do have an, in, an inability to recall uh, certain aspects, uh, um, especially in, in terms of the, the period of the actual stressor. So that's something to just just to bear in mind. Um, uh, one of the other things I certainly could have asked in the interview as well was the this issue of, of gaining revenge. Um, if he said quietly, you know, I should do when I asked him about whether he wanted to gain revenge and I could have explored that um, a little bit further um, and it would also have been more important to, to see if he had any plan whether he did have any plans around around this so let's go on to um, just some of the key things that we're looking for in this station so again um, after I'd introduced myself and set the scene um, we did an exploration of the onset and duration uh, and progression of the symptoms and also whenever um, we're, we're looking at the symptoms if you get the chance um, look, also looking at symptom severity so for example you know how often are, are the flashbacks occurring for example um, and so again the types of things that we're looking for are 
our flashbacks, as we've mentioned, avoidance behaviours, um, emotional detachment or, or numbness, um, hyperarousal, um, things like gaining revenge or other anger ruminations um, about the event. Uh, in, although not specific um, in this particular example, but uh, potential feelings of, of guilt related to the trauma uh, and uh, the current impact it's having on uh, the level of functioning. Um, and looking at coping strategies, again, um, we're looking at, uh, the key thing there is uh, whether they're uh, abusing substances or not, uh, and then going on to comorbidity. And in this a particular seven minute scenario, I just focused on depression. Um, but the other coexisting conditions could be panic disorder um, as well, for example. And then I also looked at whether uh, he, he had any ongoing uh, compensation claims, and then also uh, uh, looked at um, potential past psychiatric history uh, and pre morbid personality to give me an idea of, of, pro of prognosis. So let's uh, just go on to some of the the key um, issues in the script. So again, um, after the introduction and setting the scene, I understand that you've been having difficulty at work. Could you show me in your own words what's been happening? I see, and then when did this all start? And again, did anything happen at that time to make you feel like this? So again, and then we're, the key thing there is that we're, we're trying to confirm the onset of symptoms uh, within six months of the event. And then again, when they disclose the, um, the trauma to you, it's having a statement of empathy um, about this. So an example I've got there is again, you know, that, that must have been extreme, an extremely distressing or, or horrible experience for you. And then these are just some of the examples of uh, some of the ways I elicited uh, the symptoms without it sounding uh, like a tick box approach. So you said that you've been feeling restless. Um, have you been able to sleep? And then if they say no, and then again, why is that? Uh, uh, and then you could then you could inquire, do you ever get nightmares about what happened? How often are you thinking about the incident? Have you ever had occasions where you, you've been reliving the incident vividly? So again, looking for flashbacks. And then again, looking at questions on, on avoidance. I mean, um, I've, I've got here, do you, do, you, do, you avoid, do you try to avoid taking same route to work, which could be one example. Um, I mean, it might be a good idea if you have the time to prefix that with, um, have you had any problems with going to work? Uh, and they might say, oh, I've been late to work and why is that? And then eliciting the symptoms of avoidance that way. Um, or a, a question such as, have you ever been back to where it happened? Um, and then no, and then why is that? To looking at symptoms of avoidance. Um, if say it was a, it was a, a soldier um, that you were speaking to, um, and and he'd come back from a tour of duty uh, abroad, um, a question you could ask are you know are you due to be redeployed there again? How does that make you feel? Uh, to, to 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 look at symptoms of, of avoidance. Again, then moving on to to hypervigilance, do you feel more on edge than usual? Or making a comment on, you know, I see that you appear, you're looking quite restless, do you feel more on edge than usual? Or do small things get you frightened more easily? Could you give me an example? Okay. And then again, coping strategies, how have you been coping with all of this? Do you drink alcohol at all? Is it more often than usual? Uh, do you take any other, do you take any other uh, drugs at all? Okay. And obviously, this has been a very difficult time for you. How do you see the future at the moment? How would you describe your mood at the moment? And in terms of your general energy levels, how have they been? Are you managing to enjoy anything at all? And have you had any thoughts about not wanting to carry on? And again, um, just um, just coming back to the point about exploring feelings of guilt or emotional detachment. Again, that would be more. Uh, relevant to as, you know, if they were a soldier or fireman or, or police officer in a situation where they felt they could have acted differently, then it, then it, then it, is, um, it, it is important to ask about guilt-associated symptoms. 
Okay, and then again, just just coming on to the uh, to the other aspects of the interview. Have you ever seen a psychiatrist before? And again, impact on relationships. Are you in a relationship at the moment? How have things been? How has your temper been? Um, and again, it's it's depending on what on what they say there. Okay, and then have your relationships with your friends been since the incident as well? Are there any compensation claims pending? Um, and then again, some some inquiries to their pre-morbid personality, either you know, how would your friends describe it before this incident ever happened, or um, and then I've got you know I, I, I obviously we always I, in order to, to keep rapport going I, I I would use their name when I'm asking a question like this. So John, I mean if I'd met you before this had happened, how would you have described yourself um, as, as as one example? Okay, so let's uh, briefly talk about uh, PTSD. Um, at the risk of developing um, it in the general population after exposure to a, a major life event is around 10 to 15 percent and it's more common in, in, in women than men. Okay and then going on to um, some risk factors for, for PTSD. Again this isn't uh, certainly isn't an exhaustive list, uh, just some of the key ones to try and bear in mind. And uh, the first one is um, if you have a uh, a pre-morbid anxious uh, personality type uh, that can uh, that can put you more at risk uh, to developing PTSD versus whether you are more hardened and have a psychopathic type personality. Uh, the, I mean, the way I try to remember that is um, if you think of someone like James Bond, who um, was quite clearly had some types of psychopathic uh, personality issues, and, and he, he never got uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. In any of the films that I've I've, I've seen, uh, so that's the way I remember that. Um, if you've got a low IQ, uh, that can uh, that puts you at more at risk compared to whether you have a, a higher intelligence level. Um, a low self-esteem um, is also a risk factor as well as having a, a past psychiatric history. Again, as I said, uh, none of the, the things here are, are exhaustive. It's just to to keep keep things at the back of your mind. Comorbidity, as we've, as we've looked at, uh, depression and anxiety symptoms, as well as coping strategies, which would be uh, substance, substance use, including alcohol abuse. Um, I mean, it, also to bear in mind, if it's more of a complex PTSD case, um, for example, if they've had previous histories of childhood sexual abuse, for example, then uh, other comorbid issues could, Im could involve eating disorders, um, uh, chronic suicidality or a severe disassociative symptoms. Okay. And then in terms of differential diagnosis, um, again, uh, uh, I've got a number of things written there. Um, obviously, uh, stress reactions and adjustment disorder. Personality changes if, if the, if the um, symptoms have been there for, for more than two years. Uh, depression, anxiety, again, uh, in terms of irritability. And, and withdrawal, uh, panic disorders, and uh, OCD, again, that's scraping the barrel in terms of um, whether they're having uh, persistent thoughts or, or, or reminders of the event. And then coming on to, ma coming on to management again, as, as I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, 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 with some of the things on this particular slide, uh, I uh, put in there trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which was um, in, the, in the NICE guidelines issued in 2005. And generally, um, CBT is used more for single index traumas, so where there's one specific, specific event, as opposed to more uh, complex multiple traumas with developmental traumas such as childhood sexual abuse. And then just thinking about the, the cognitive distortion, uh, which occurs in PTSD, um, it's, the cognitive distortion is, is that there's a, that the past uh, a past event is perceived to be still causing a persistent threat um, in the present day. And so CBT would focus on a number of different strategies to help them process that memory in a less stressful way to deal with that perception. So for example, talking about the trauma or reliving um, it uh, in terms of behavioural therapy. Um, it does have a strong evidence base that it does work. However, as you can imagine, it does have a, a quite a high withdrawal rate because it's very difficult work in that they do have to disclose information about 
the, uh, the, the traumatic event uh, and they can get worse during the therapy before they actually do start to get better. Uh, and then we, again, EMDR is something which uh, I'm sure you, you, you know about and that focuses on, on processing memories using cicada guide movements as well, as well as, uh, which, which involves using the imaginal exposure, some aspects of cognitive therapy um, and uh, elements of other types of stimulation using sort of tapping or, or, or tones during each of, this, each of the sessions. And uh, support groups and family therapy are also um, effective, dependent on, on, on the patient's circumstances, along with uh, pharmacological treatment. And, and pharmacological treatment, I, 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 again, um, high dose SSRIs are, for example, certainly you know, uh, an example of what's used. Again, this isn't obviously a comprehensive uh, lecture into PTSD. Uh, and again, um, other um, adjunctive medications one could use are um, mood stabilizers if they're hyper, hyper aroused, if there's hyper aroused symptoms are severe, um, uh, sleeping tablets obviously, uh, and or again the judicious use of, of benzodiazepines dependent on, on, on each particular patient. Okay, and then and then in terms of the prognostic, some prognostic. Factors again, as you, as you remember, chronic a chronic PTSD is a lot has a poor prognosis and is more difficult to treat. So early recognition and treatment uh, can help uh, is is with the prognosis. Obviously, having a supportive social environment is 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 is, is very useful where they're able to talk about um, their experiences in a non-judgmental environment, and and they're encouraged not to avoid situations or encouraged not to drink. And also trying to get some type of closure uh, on the event, so they're not dealing with with ongoing issues secondary to to, to the initial trauma. Um, I mean, depending on how severe the, the stress actually is, generally half of people who do develop PTSD do tend to recover in the first year, uh, and about the other twenty to thirty percent do have ongoing symptoms. And then, in terms of possible alternate scenarios, again, with the um, the, the the things that I could think of are obviously having a different type of um, traumatic scenario. So a soldier coming back from war, uh, reliving the events at home, a uh, policeman or fireman involved in a uh, potential traumatic issue. I mean, um, and some of the questions I've seen, if they give a clue to the person's profession in the question, uh, then uh, and, they're, and they're presenting with anxiety symptoms, uh, then there is a... Um, then, you certainly need, do need to keep it back in mind that this could be a PTSD station that you're about to walk into. Um, but the other thing to bear in mind is that you know they, they may not make it uh, completely obvious uh, to, begin, to begin with, and the patient might have anxiety; it may just be withdrawn. Um, so, so again, the, the key things are obviously um, at the beginning of uh, the station of, of asking open questions uh, and looking for specific precipitants. So. Um, I hope that's again. I hope that's useful for you uh, for 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 dealing with uh, PTSD stations that come up in the cask. Um, as again, continue practicing, and I'll see you uh, in the next.